Anyway, we're going to begin, as our custom, we begin with the sounding of the shofar, the ram's horn, calling our hearts to the attention of God's presence. He's been here waiting for us. We're going to celebrate in his presence. From Joel 2 to Kushafar B'Tzion Kuru blow a shofar in Zion, proclaim a solemn assembly. Baruch Hashem, the sound of the shofar. Baruch Hashem, let's bless his name together. Baruch Hu Adonai HaMevorach Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Ba'ed Blessed be the Lord who is blessed. Blessed, blessed be the, the Lord, Lord who is blessed, blessed forever, forever and, and ever. ever. Amen. Amen. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Baruch Shem, Kivod Malchuto, Leolam Vaed. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever. Amen. And when Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what is the most important command? He answered with the words of the Shema and said the following. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Messiah then said, the second command is like unto the first, the Ahafto l'recha kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Peace, peace on the Sabbath, on Shabbat. This is our time to just... Put all the distractions away. We're going to sing it, though. Let's sing it together. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat 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 Shalom. Shabbat Shabbat. Shabbat Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shabbat. Shabbat Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Shabbat 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 Shalom. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. They who dwelt in the shadow of death, to them has that light shine. Arise and shine, for your light has come. Arise and shine, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise and shine, for your
has risen upon you. Out of the gloom and the darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see. In the place of his glory and grace, the people shall all be set free. Arise and shine, for your light has come. Arise and shine, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon As the new day, then shall your light break forth as the morning. Your darkness as the new day. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Dwelt in the shadow of death, to them has that light shine. Arise and shine, for your light has come. Arise, arise and shine. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise and shine, for your you lord we know that you are coming soon deliver us save us save us oh god save us and deliver us we know that mashiach is coming soon thank you lord you are welcome in this place and we are thanking you for the victory that we have in you and not only we don't have to wait until you return although we're really excited about it we have the victory even now and I thank you, Lord God, that we do and that we can get it in your word and by your ruach, by your spirit. Well, we're also rejoicing Praise along Lord. with our hearts cry. We're crying out to him for him to come. But we are knowing that these are the days of Elijah and he is coming. We're having the victory in him, in him alone. You guys ready? We're going to rejoice together. We want you to sing it out. I'm going to be listening to hear if you're singing. Let's clap together. Give them a clap offering. Guys, you can do better than that. Come on. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant, Moses, 
righteousness being restored. And though these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword, still we are the voice in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the shoulder call, so lift your voice, in the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion still salvation comes. Hallelujah, salvation is almost here, it is here now. These are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are wide in the Shabbat Shalom. We welcome everyone to Beth Zion, and our calling as a congregation is to declare Messiah to the Jewish heart of Central Jersey and to share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes. It's our desire to be very clear and deliberate in our presenting the authenticity of Messiah's walk when he was here on earth and what he accomplished for the Jewish people and for all people. It says of Messiah that in Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And we are thankful for God for opening up the doors of opportunity for all nations to be able to experience the wonder of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob.
and the intimacy that he wants to make known to us. And so we are glad that we can come together to be a blessing in the community around us and to be able to also share effectively. You know, people are hurting these days. Everybody knows that. People are feeling rather lonely with masks and separation. What we should never do is separate ourselves from God. And I believe that people are discovering their need to be drawing near to him. And when we draw near to him, he draws near to us. We want to be a blessing to people. We want to be like living letters known and read of all people. And that people can not only hear our words, but our actions follow. And we want to always put this message back into its original Jewish context. You don't have to be Jewish to love and know the Jewish Messiah. But it's good to know his neighborhood and where he came from. So everybody should learn these things uh, instead of necessarily all of the cultural additions that have come on over the centuries. And so we are grateful for that opportunity. And uh, listen, don't hide your message under a bushel. Go out there and tell. It says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There are people hungry right now to hear a message of hope. And you may not think you're equipped, but you have experienced the hope and the presence of God in your life. And you can bring a word in season that can turn hearts into a place of abundance, from a place that feels like a curse to a place that is filled with God's blessing. And God is wanting to use each one of you to do that. And we are going to mention just a couple of quick announcements. A couple of quick announcements. Let people know, you know, I, 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 it's a little bit difficult, to, difficult when we were showing the service at 11 o'clock every, every Saturday morning and editing it before and doing that. But with the services being live, um, people aren't always sure when in the evening it's going to come out after we put it together. So please uh, let your friends know, let people know, and uh, send the link to people and let them know because I think that these are things people really do need to experience and know. And uh, the only way we're going to let them know is if we go out there and tell them. So uh, it's easy to just send the link. A couple of quick announcements. If you fall asleep during any part of the service and you want to hear the rest of the message, it'll be on video. It'll be online at bethzion.org slash live. You can also listen to back broadcasts as well. And uh, really, again, encourage you to share these with other people as well. Also, you'll notice if you got the newsletter, how many got the newsletter? All right. You should all look for that newsletter because Marlene writes these great newsletters. I get to edit them, but she writes these wonderful, they're really wonderful, and I would encourage you to do that. But it also has a short list of the high holiday at a glance um, schedule for that's coming up. We all and we do ask for people to register. Uh, there, is, there, was a, there was a little change in that it was limited to 50 people, but they just changed it to 25% of capacity. So there's actually room for around 70 or 75 people. So uh, encourage people to, but it helps us to know if, um, you know, who's coming uh, to this. So we'll be having that up for the high holidays, and we'll have it designated for which ones you're coming to. Um, Kol Nidre, all of the services will be here, and uh, we'll talk about it more as it comes along. But we're going to get into the word. Avino Malkano, our Father and our King, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your word and look at the portions for this week. Speak deeply to us the way that these things apply to us in the days that we're living. Lord, help us to be a testimony to those around us to be like a, sh a light shining in the darkness. Lord, bring your transformation power first to us as we listen to your word and go through this section. And then as we bring that word to others, we thank you, Lord, in Yeshua's name. Amen. 
Today's portion is called Kitavo. It means when you come in, and it's taken from Devarim, Deuteronomy chapter 26, beginning in verse 1, when it says, where it says, when you have come to the land Hashem your God is giving you as an inheritance, take in possession of it and settle there. You are to take the first fruits of your crops, the grounds yield, which you will harvest from your land that the Lord your God is giving you. Put them in a basket and go to the place where the Lord your God will choose to have his name live. When we look through this, we see that God is saying, when you come in, when you come into your own, you come into your own land, you come into your, it's like when your ship comes in, it's, this is what everyone was looking for. The promise that God made to his people now was getting ready to happen. After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, he is giving them the final discussion, the final details before they enter into the land. And so it's a very exciting time. And one of the things that we'll notice is that in each case, he tells them what will be producing benefit and what will be a deterrent to the blessings. He tells them the curses that will follow and the blessings that will follow, one for not obeying and one for listening and obeying. And I was struck by a lot of the details that was in this section and the thought occurred to me, the title for this is called Messianic Privilege. Messianic Privilege. You know, today we hear people talking about white privilege, economic privilege, all kinds of, uh, let's see, TV star privilege, all different kinds, elitism and all of that. Everybody seems to be having factions to fight off to see who can be the one to have privilege. You know, some people, if they work it right, can have poverty being a privilege. Can have, who can be the one that is most being attacked this week? And it seems like their moment of privilege is there. They have special dispensations that are available. But I want to look at this in a different light. I want you to think, when we talk about messianic privilege or maybe holy privilege. We're not talking about holier than thou. We're not talking about a self-righteous kind of manifest that is going to go out and say, you're doing it wrong, you're not doing it right, I'm doing it better. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about privilege in the sense of having one-upmanship on somebody else. But there is definitely within the framework of these verses a reference to messianic privilege. And I want to explain this because we are, as children of God, the king's kids. We automatically are privileged. We have a heritage, an inheritance, as he says here. He says, when you have come into the land the Lord your God is giving you as your inheritance, that means there's something in there for us. There's something very special. There is a unique place that God has given us, a calling. What is unique about this is that as we look through messianic privilege, sometimes when you hear the term privilege, you get the idea that there are the haves and the have-nots. The have-nots don't have privilege. The haves get to get two sets of justice sometimes. We read about that in a few portions where it says not to have two scales, not to have two weights of measure, not to have, as it says, injustice, but says justice, only justice pursue. We've spoken about that before. We also looked last week about what it was when we come into marriage and all of the elements that were a part of that. And everything that God is laying out for us is telling us that we have a standing with God, that we have a position with him, that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. That sounds like privilege, doesn't it? But the difference between the way people use the term privilege today is different than the way that God is using it in this case. 
the privilege, and who had more privilege than Yeshua? The actual son of God. God himself coming down to dwell among us. I would say he had great privilege. But what did he do with that privilege? See, the privilege was the opportunity to open up the doors of privilege to everyone. In fact, there's a place where it says, for the exclusive only, whosoever will. That sounds like a pretty unexclusive, exclusive place of privilege, doesn't it? Whosoever will can come. Whosoever will. God wants to bring his wisdom his guidance, his direction, his presence. He wants to make himself known. He wants to live in the midst of us. And he wants to bless us. When we look at Yeshua, we see all of the different prophecies that are made during this time, during this seven-week period in the verses from Isaiah. All of them messianic passages. But here in this section, we find that there are some Elements, I want to just mention just a little bit to you in this portion of the Torah. Because in here, it spells out a list of curses and blessings. I'm not going to go through all of these. But I want to mention a few of them to you because I want to show you that the list doesn't really matter as much as what puts you into one or the other lists. Listening to the Lord puts you in one list. Not obeying and going your own way puts you in another list. Sort of like a naughty or nice list. But in this case, it's a little bit different because this has real detail and real elements to it that are important. But I find this interesting that he says, in starting this off as he's explaining to them about the inheritance that is theirs, and we'll get into more of these details in a moment, but when you, when you look at it, uh, he's telling them, here is what God is going to do. He's going to give you, you're going to bring in the tithe of the land. You're going to bring this in. And it talks about it in a little bit of a different way than most people think in terms of tithing. It talks about something that is a part of the building of the community. It is setting up a structure of respect within the community for the Lev Levi'im, the Levites, for foreigners, orphans, widows, you'll see that in verse 12 of Deuteronomy 26, that there is that tithe that comes in so that you can have enough food to satisfy them while staying with you, while they are there. And then it says, you are to say in the presence of the Lord your God, I have rid my house of things set aside for God and given them to the, Le the Levites, the foreigners, the orphans, and the widows, in keeping with every one of the mitzvot, the commands you have given. I haven't disobeyed any of your mitzvot or forgotten them. Forgotten them is a key word because it seems like we tend to forget when it comes to that. Things are going well, we sort of take for granted and then allow things to drift. But when we understand what God's privilege for us represents, it doesn't just mean, oh, you're getting special treatment. See, the special treatment is only special because we are experiencing it. But the special treatment isn't special if everybody has access to be able to have it. This is something that is important for us to understand. Normally, when you hear people talk about privilege, it's privilege over someone else. When it comes to God's privilege that he speaks of, it is privilege that expands the kingdom of God, that allows God's presence to reign, that allows all of the benefits of the kingdom to be made manifest without compromise and without distraction. It also speaks at the beginning of this discussion of a passage that we read, read during Passover. My father was a wandering Aramean. He went down to Egypt, few in number. There he became great, strong, a populous nation. But the Egyptians treated us badly. They oppressed us and imposed harsh slavery on us. So we cried out to the Lord our God, and he heard us, saw our misery, toil, and oppression, and brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wondering. Now he has brought us to this place. 
giving us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. They were certainly not feeling like they were in a privileged place when they were slaves in Egypt. Prior to that, they had a special place, and it was something that upset the Egyptian community because of Joseph and all that happened. They had a special exclusive place in Goshen. But after a while, they were afraid that this people that separated could cause problems if they aligned with an enemy. And all of the terrible things that happened, the oppression that took place, and then God, by his mighty hand, brought us out. So it's not enough to come out of whatever the oppression was, but to enter into the blessing that God has for us. And so when we look at this, uh, it goes on to show that in turning, uh, he says, in, uh, in turn, the Lord is agreeing today, this is verse 18, that you are his own unique treasure. That sounds pretty exclusive, doesn't it? Privilege. We are his own unique treasure. But again, not to compare with others, but because God wants all people to come to know him and experience this blessing and these list of blessings. As he promised you that you are to observe all his mitzvot, he ties it all into the issue of obedience to God and to his word. When we look at this, uh, he goes on to say in another place uh, that we are to write the Torah. They were putting a pillar up when they were going to the land to remind them with all the words of the Torah on it of God's promise to them. And then it says this at the end of that chapter. You are to write it on stones, all the word on brown stones, all the words of the Torah very clearly. Next, Moses and the Kohanim with the Levi'im spoke to all Israel. They said, be quiet and listen, Israel. Today you have become the people of Hashem, your God. Therefore, you are to listen to what the Lord, your God, says and obey his mitzvot, his laws, which I am giving you today. What he is doing is he is saying to them today, he says, be quiet and listen. Today, you've become the people of God. Today, you enter into messianic privilege and all the benefits that are a part of that kingdom. When we look at this, we can see in a number of places. Uh, I, I, I just want to touch on two quick things. In Deuteronomy 27, it talks about the curses. In Deuteronomy 28, it talks about the blessings. And uh, I prefer the blessings, but hey, listen, I want to point a couple things out. There is a breakdown of society when we don't follow in the steps of our king as the king's kids. There are some things he says, and one of the first things it mentions is idolatry. But the second thing it mentions is this. And they said they agreed. You know, they said not to make carved images. All the people responded, amen. And the second one, a curse on anyone who dishonors his father or mother. All the people are to say, amen. Somebody who moves his neighbor's boundary markers. Now, you may wonder why are these listed? And these are the first things listed. Look at what happens when people begin to set up a double standard. We begin to move the boundary markers of what someone claims to be theirs. Somebody else wants envy and other things come in, and we find problems. We find that there is a dishonoring of father and mother, and with it, the entire family structure. When this begins to slip away, all of the reference points begin to be blurred, and we begin to not fully understand that the curses suddenly are upon us. Gradually, we find ourselves distancing from the one who has given us privilege to be called his children. Suddenly, we find him appearing to seemingly be far away. But we're the ones who have distanced ourselves. I remember the story about a husband and wife who were driving in the car. 
And the wife was sitting over by the window in the passenger side, and the husband was driving the car. And she was sort of reminiscing. She says, honey, you remember when we first were married? I used to sit under your arm as you drove, and you drove with one hand, and you had my arm around me and all of that. You remember that? He said, I never moved. The reality is that she's reminiscing about something that was not presently a part of the package. But he never moved. She did. When we talk about the bride of Messiah and we talk about we as part of his body. Last week we spoke about marriage and talked about a get and divorce and all of that. In reality, when it says to honor your husband... And it talks about the other. We are like that. Go beyond just simply the husband and wife. Look at the expression of what's happening. Have we distanced ourselves from God, who is a husband to us? Have we distanced ourselves from him and feel the sense of abandonment, not because he abandoned us, but because we moved away from the driver. We moved away from the one who was in control and bringing direction for us. Have we moved away and now feel the isolation and abandonment that comes with it because we have not moved and stayed within the place where the blessings are to be poured out. I'm thinking of a couple of other passages. You know, I like the one in the blessings where it says that the Lord will order a blessing to be with you in your barns. And in everything you undertake, he will bless you in the land. I like that about the barns. We need a blessing for our barn to be able to have that move forward. He says, you will be the head and not the tail. There is a certain element, not of elitism, but when we are walking in sync with God our Father, when we are walking in the king's way, we are experiencing the blessing of God, and we are not in a place of sorrow and calamity and all of that, but we are the head and not the tail. We are, in a sense, set up by God to be in charge as his kids. Not to lord it over other people, but to give us opportunity to experience all the blessings that God has for us. And it goes on. I'm not going to go into all of these things, but he talks about a number of You can look this up yourself and see it. Uh, He says, uh, there's some here. He says he'll strike them with insanity, blindness, and confusion. Groping in the dark or groping at nighttime like a blind person, groping in the dark, unable to find your way. If you're trying, if you're going through circumstances and you feel like somehow you've lost your way and you think that God has left you, It probably isn't the case. He's still at the wheel. He's still driving. We have shifted our place from under his wing and under his arm to where we are off daydreaming and watching all the world around us and not engaged in that one who loves us so much. And so all of these things, it becomes like insanity. It becomes blindness, unable to see what's going on, confusion, stumbling In the middle of noonday, like it's night or like we're blind. There are so many things in here. He says, uh, he, he also describes, really, let's see, verse 41 of chapter, chapter 28, or is that 29, 28. He says, you will father sons and daughters, but they won't belong to you because they will go into captivity. The foreigner living with you will rise higher and higher while you sink lower and lower. I'm not making a political statement. I'm just saying that these are things that he says happens when we are not walking in the place of favor with God. Sometimes people will talk about being in favor with God and they become venomous words going forth about other people. That is not the same thing. It's not because foreigners have come in. It's because we've abandoned our calling and inheritance that God's made available. And part of that we're going to go into in a moment here to explain. 
a nation grim in appearance, whose people neither respect the old nor pity the young. Severity of siege, distress from your enemies are inflicted on you, eating offspring of your own body. Horrible things. Even the most gentle and sensitive man among you will be without pity for his brother, his beloved wife, or his surviving children. You will be left few in number, whereas you were once numerous as the stars in the sky, verse 62, because you will not pay attention to the voice of the Lord your God. He mentioned earlier, we were few in number, and God brought us out by a mighty hand. Isn't that what he does? He allows us to diminish because we've shifted away from what God's promised. And then he says, I will restore you. You'll be left few in number. It says, thus it will come about that just as once the Lord, verse 63, took joy in seeking to do good and increase your numbers, so now the Lord will take joy in causing you to perish. He'll take joy in that? Well, it isn't that he takes joy in seeing us perish. He understands that for some reason, we feel the need to come to the bottom of our own self effort to where he then comes in and says, now I can do something. They weren't interested in his help. They were mocking him. And then he came in. He says in chapter 29, verse 5, nevertheless, to this day, Hashem has not given you a heart to understand, eyes to see, or ears to hear. He says, therefore, observe the words of this covenant and obey them so that you can make everything you do prosper. God wants us to prosper. He wants us to do better. He wants us to go. And look at the description of Isaiah 60, of Isaiah 60 which is the Haftorah portion. Look at what it's describing. It's describing our people after they have fallen, after they have gone astray, after they've abandoned God. And look what he says. Arise, shine, for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For although darkness covers the earth and thick darkness the people, on you Hashem will rise, over you will be seen his glory. He's describing messianic privilege. But it's not to make mockery of those who don't experience. He's just saying, look, you've come into the same place that everybody goes when they don't listen. And now you have opportunity to be able to experience the blessing of God. Nations will go toward your light. Kings, towards the, your shining splendor. Raise your eyes. Look around. They all assemble. Coming to you. Your sons are coming from far away. Far off. Remember, you're going to go into exile. Your children, you'll birth them, and then they'll be taken captive. And he says, here's what's going to happen as the light of God shines in you. You'll begin to see God turning things around. Raise up your eyes. Look, you're hopeless. Why raise up your eyes? Because when we are downcast and in depression over what's been going on, we tend to be downcast, looking down. There's no hope. We don't look up. But here he says to look up. He says, raise your eyes and look around. There's a different perspective that you can see in what's going on. All this darkness may be around you, but you will be light in the midst of that darkness. All of this is a part of being able to experience messianic privilege. And he goes on to talk about all of these different things that will happen. In the past, verse 15, you were abandoned and hated so that no one would even pass through you. But now I will make you the pride of the ages, a joy for many generations. He says in verse 19, no more will the sun be your light by day nor the moonlight shine on you. Instead, Hashem will be your light forever and your God, your glory. No longer will your sun go down, your moon no longer wane, for the Lord will be your light forever and your days of mourning will end. When we look in the new covenant, I want to mention a few passages, and I want you to think. These are familiar things, so I just want to tell you like a story. When we talk about messianic privilege, there is something else that comes up. I mentioned before that we have Messiah, the ultimate 
in privilege. He was the son of God. He was the one who created all things. And here he was coming, but his privilege was not received by those around him, was it? What we saw was this. Remember the parable where he talks about a rich man who, who sends people to get a, a, an idea of what was going on with his investments. And they did terrible things to them, didn't show them respect. Finally, he says, I know what I'll do. I'll send my son. And they said, here is the one with privilege. We get rid of the son. We've got it all for ourselves. Isn't that interesting? The one with the most privilege was disdained by those who had no eye to see what God was doing. And so you see, privilege sometimes gets you in trouble. He says, they hated me first. What about in Isaiah 53? We read during this entire season, the passages around it. In the synagogues, they don't actually read it, and yet it is the key center peg of that entire messianic prophetic word. It says that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and through his stripes, we are healed. All we have gone astray, turned every one to his own way, but the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Part of the privilege of the Son of God was to come and be abused and lay down his life for the ones who were causing him trouble. He came, and while we were yet sinners, he died for us. The one who had ultimate privilege understood that part of the privilege was to come and lay his life down for those who did not understand what God wanted to pour out in blessings in their life saw them tortured by their own decisions, saw them reaping havoc in everything they see, seeing their cities being destroyed, seeing all of these people fighting against one another. Who could be top dog? Who could be the one to beat all the others? And then, as he says here, a little bit different, he says, to the point where you would even devour your own children. Isn't it interesting that when people set out to destroy whatever the foundations and the cultural structure is, to mold it into their own image, they make alliances with everybody else, working against one common enemy, but when that enemy is taken down, if taken down, they begin to eat and devour one another because they can't live without taking somebody down, and in the process, they take themselves down too, and all of civilization crumbles and is destroyed. God wants to avoid that, and part of understanding the principle of messianic privilege is to understand that we have a responsibility to bring a message of life to people who are in darkness and have no light, to be able to bring hope where there seems to be only hopelessness. I mentioned before that he says we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. But for what purpose and to what end? So that we could experience and open up the door of opportunity or open the door of opportunity to the things that we have experienced from God and help others. Truly holy privilege carries the responsibility to expand the ranks with everyone to whomsoever will. This is God's purpose. But we'd rather judge everybody. We'd rather tell everybody what they're doing wrong. And yet God says, judge yourself so that you be not judged. We need to evaluate where we stand. Are we taking advantage of the privilege that God's given us to be his children? Are we living like the children of God? Are we living like the way he says we should? If not, there is no message of the kingdom going forward because we are squashing the kingdom. The kingdom only exists where we allow the king to reign. And if he is not actually reigning in our lives, 
then all these other things begin to happen. He says in that chapter, Matthew 13, he also says this in verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. A man found it, hid it again, and then with great joy went and sold everything he owned and bought that field. He's describing that when we catch a vision of what it means to experience the kingdom of God, to experience God's kingship in our life, understanding that we've discovered the greatest hidden treasure that could possibly exist. It says he sold everything to be able to buy the land, to be able to cultivate what it was that was there as a treasure. For us, we are his treasure. He said that we are his, peculiar, we are his treasure. We read that a little bit earlier. I want to close with this section. Yaakov, James, chapter 1. He says, and here's what happens. When you find yourself in the aftermath of all of this confusion and everything is going in crazy ways, you don't step back and say, all right, whose fault is it? It's their fault. No, no, it's their fault. No, we say it's your fault. They go back and forth over whose fault it is, and none of it produces any results or any solutions, just accusation which is the mindset of the adversary, who is the accuser of the brethren. But here's what happens. He says this. He says, regard it all joy, my brothers, when you face various kinds of temptations. For you know that the testing of your trust produces perseverance. But let perseverance do its work, its complete work, so that you may be complete and whole, lacking in nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, ask of God who gives liberally and doesn't hold back, and it will be given to you. But do it without wavering. A double-minded man is unstable and knows all his ways. Why is a person unstable? Why is he double-minded? Because he can't decide whether he's going to take advantage of the privilege of being in relationship with Messiah or go with his own direction and his own ways, which will lead us astray. Now, some would say, well, we have a right to do what we want to do. Yes, you do. But if everybody claims that right, everybody does what's right in their own eyes, eventually there is no boundary. There is no structure. There is nothing to be able to determine where the borders are. There are no boundaries. And so everything becomes dog eat dog everything becomes a breakdown. He says, let the brother, verse 9 of Yaakov, James 1, let the brother in humble circumstances boast about his high position. Now, he's not saying if you're in a humble circumstance and you have nothing, you boast about having nothing. No, his high position is his relationship with God. He is part of the messianic privileged. And in doing that, he understands. It says, but let the rich brother boast about his being humbled, since like a wildflower he will pass away. All of our accomplishments, all of our acquisitions can be gone in a moment. The one acquisition that doesn't go away is our relationship with God, with our experiencing the fullness of what God has for us. And what does he say? He says, how blessed is a man who perseveres through temptation. For after he has passed the test, he will receive as his crown the life which God has promised to those who love him. So no one, no one being tempted to say, I'm being tested by God, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot tempt by, be tempted by evil, and God himself tempts no one. Rather, each person is being tempted whenever he is being dragged off and enticed by the bait of his own desire. It always comes back to our own desire. When we choose to establish our own privilege, self-privilege, we remove ourselves from the messianic privilege, 
from the place where God's made provision for us beyond our expectations, beyond our imagination. And we settle for something less and think because it's more than someone else has, it's better. It's not. It all is wood, hay, and stubble. And what does he say? He says, we're enticed by our own desires. Then having conceived, the desire gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Don't delude yourselves, my dear brothers. Every good act of giving and every perfect gift is from above. Then he gives this illustration. No variable of turning. God is there. He is wanting these things to be understood. And then he says this, and this is the part that I think is so important. We go astray on this. Listen, he says in verse 21, so rid yourselves of all vulgarity and obvious evil and receive meekly the word implanted in you that can save your lives. God has given us his mandate. He's given us his mandate to be able to know what it is that he requires of us, what it is that, are, that explains the benefits and the responsibilities that are a part of having this kind of spiritual privilege. And he says, get rid of all of these things and receive with meekness the word implanted in you so that you can live. Don't deceive yourselves by only hearing what the word says, but do it. For whoever hears the word but doesn't do what it says, is like someone who looks his, into a mirror, he leaves, he sees all the blemishes, all the problems, walks away and can point all the problems out in somebody else and forget what he saw. But if we will go before God and allow him to cleanse us, to make a return to him, to repent of all of these things, he will immediately begin to bring back all of us from the place of exile and restore us. Whoever hears the word but doesn't do what it says, is like someone who sees himself in a mirror, his face, and as he walks away, he forgets what he saw. And he keeps living in that place God wants to set us free. The son had privilege. It says here, sin corrupts privilege. When you see what it says, our own will, our own ways corrupts the very thing that God is saying. And so what it is, sin corrupts privilege and nullifies the benefits. We need to be able to be in a place where God can have his way. It says in James also, a person's anger, verse 20. He says, therefore, my dear brothers, remember what he said before? I'm going to close with this. Remember what he said at the beginning? He said to them in Deuteronomy, he says, Moses said to them, do what God says. Listen, don't get angry, don't envy, listen and obey, right? What does it say in James here? My dear brothers, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry, for the person's anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. If our response to the things around us is anger, or if everything is fuming around us, there is no righteousness in that. We need to be able to hold our tongue. We need to be able to listen. We need to be able to listen to God and allow him to transform us and experience what he experienced. He told us to love in the same way that he has loved us. He laid his life down for us. And we don't want to be inconvenienced. We need to be in a place where we understand what the privilege is, that it's available for everyone, and that we are disseminating that to people in a way that they understand the reality of it, not just in word. Everyone in that day said, amen, whatever you said, we will do it. And they did not. If you find yourself in a place like that, you've made a prayer and you said, God, I'll do whatever you say. But circumstances come along and we start to compromise. We need to understand that God wants us to look into that mirror, to allow the spirit of God to show us us. And to make decisions that will produce actions that will give us the ability, like he said, 
Let perseverance have its perfect work, making us perfect and entire, lacking nothing. God wants to give us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Part of that is that he esteemed others better than himself. Do we esteem others better than ourselves? Or do we say, wait a second, I want to get mine. Part of the privilege is to be able to invite others to experience the open door of God's love for them, to see them set free and transformed. Lord, we thank you for your promises. We thank you for the fact that you, as the one with ultimate privilege, emptied yourself, became of no reputation, and submitted even to death. Not like the prodigal son who squandered his privilege. Not like his brother who didn't understand the privilege. But Messiah, you laid down your life for us, emptied yourself. You had the source of all life, and you emptied yourself so that we could experience the privilege of knowing you, of being brought into relationship with the Father. Lord, nobody had privilege like you, and yet you opened the door for us to experience all the richness of your kingdom. Lord, in the day we're living, we need to be voices and living letters that people can see and understand in our actions. The orphans are taken care of. The widows are taken care of. The poor are taken care of. There is a heart of compassion, of generosity, of reaching out, of building the community in the framework that you've laid out for us. Not forcing people to do it, but forcing ourselves to come under your tutelage, to listen to the Spirit of God, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, making your word alive in us. Lord, we thank you that you've called us to a place of privilege that's not exclusive, but open for everyone. Help us to reach out to those around us, even those who despise us, even those who don't like us. Let your love make a way that their hearts can be transformed and changed and experience entry into your kingdom and into your promised land a blessing that only comes through the Messiah, Yeshua. Thank you, Lord, in Yeshua's name. Amen. Let's stand. It's an amazing gift we have from God, isn't it? Why do we squander it like we do sometimes? We need to draw near to him every day, every morning, every day. In all we do, put him first. In every way, he wants to put us first. That's part of the privilege of knowing him. And the most important part of knowing him is listening to him, listening for his voice, giving us the ear of a learned one, knowing that his mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. As Aaron blessed the people of Israel, so we bless one another with these words. Yair Adonai Panavelecha Vihunecha Yisadonai Panavelecha Veyosem Lecha Shalom The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'Shem Sar Shalom, the name of our Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And everyone agreed by saying amen and amen. All right. God bless you. Shabbat Shalom. We'll see you in Shul.